and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast. It is such an extraordinary uh, experience to be the age that I am, and I will reveal that I am 67 years old, and excited and optimistic and enthusiastic and fascinated by the changes that I'm seeing taking place in the world. And I think that is a huge privilege. And I don't think many other generations have experienced that, that, uh, at, you know, in a, at a, a later time in life, you are experiencing something that you can see is, you, oh, 10 years ago, I was hoping it would happen. Now it's happening. There's no question about it happening. It's happening big time. And it's, and it's allowing quite a lot of people who've had a lot of experience in life and in business, if you like, and in technological understanding and in academic study to have a kind of second wind of opportunity and uh, uh, developing new, new things. And that is really, I think, what really fascinated me about uh, this the, this episode's guest on the Fully Charged podcast, uh, Professor David Slutsky. Now, he is um, a, 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 an academic in the United States, and he has, uh, in a few years ago, uh, formed a company. He's an entrepreneur as well as an academic. So he's a proper professor who does proper lecturing in a proper university. He will explain all about that in the episode. But he also is an entrepreneur, and he's set up a business called Formata Energy. Uh, there'll be links to Formata Energy's um, uh, web page, which is really interesting and worth checking out. Uh, I'll put those in the show notes. But Formata Energy uh, is developing... Um, Vehicle to grid systems, nothing t intrinsically uh, unusual or, or special about that because there's numerous companies are developing the technology that allows uh, an electric vehicle to uh, to accept power from whatever source it is, from the grid or from solar panels or whatever you want, uh, and, but also it allows it to send that power out of the batteries in the vehicle to either a house or to the grid or to a factory if it's a a car that or a vehicle that's connected to a, a business and that is it's the um the kind of economics of that if you like and the and the strategy of that and how the that electricity is then dealt with by the grid by the grid operating systems by the generating systems by the transmission systems it's quite complicated it's very easy to say v to g that's easy actually making that work is incredibly complicated and exciting and has loads of opportunities, but is also very challenging. And that is what Professor Slutsky, that's his, that's his gig. And he's a fascinating guy. And I just want to point out that we are, he's, he is fractionally older than me, but literally fractionally, we're both 67. And so it was really exciting to meet someone of my generation from a very different background who is involved in this stuff. So I, I really enjoyed talking to him. He will definitely get him back on the show. He's uh, an absolute dude. Uh, so please welcome to the Fully Charged podcast, Professor, Professor David Slutsky. Uh, David, thank you so much for, for joining us on the Fully Charged podcast. Uh, this is clearly a critically important aspect of the stuff we're talking about on the on the series and on the show and in the live shows and all that we're, it's constantly referred to and yet we we're not seeing a huge amount of it yet. and i'm talking v to g v to x v to h <laughs> basically can we use our cars as batteries on wheels which is why i first heard about this concept at least 12 years ago when it when i never saw anything like it and i've seen versions of it emerge every now and then but what you're doing seems to be the kind of the next the next level as it were uh of you know of this this technology i mean can you can you well for a start can you explain how you got into this what your background is technically you know because clearly you're you're quite clever i'm gonna i'm just gonna put that out there <laughs> You just you're just trying to, uh, to to lure me in before you ask me the tough <laughs> questions, Robert. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to to uh, to join your show today. I think this this topic is very important and very timely, and I'm uh, grateful that you're uh, sharing this this concept with uh, with your audience. Uh, my background's a bit odd. Um, I, I guess that makes me a bit odd. Um, 
I'm an academic. Uh, I've taught at the University of Virginia for 20 some odd years, started in the um, business school, taught in the architecture school, have spent 12 years in the engineering school, and I'm literally the only trained philosopher on any of those faculties. So I'm an wow. unusual <laughs> academic. Um, had a background in public policy, uh, served at the, as a political appointee in the Clinton administration at the White House and at the EPA, and also have served in local electric government. But mostly I've been an entrepreneur who's spent his career committed to uh, trying to improve the lot of, of, of folks on the planet, which is why I started from out of energy back in 2010. So right. maybe a quick overview of you know why I started the company, what we do. Yes, please. Um, yeah, that'd be great. And it's it's less about Fermata and mostly about the technology. I, I set out, my, I had two, philosophers have intentions. They, they don't just do stuff. They have to have an intention behind it. My two intentions were number one, to accelerate the adoption of EVs. And number two was to accelerate the transition to renewable energy on the grid. Two right. ambitious undertakings to be sure. And those two intentions intersect nicely at this technology, V to X, as we call it, because yeah. it's not just the grid. So how does that work? On the vehicle side, I would submit that the single biggest obstacle to scale adoption of EVs is that they're a little bit pricey compared to a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle. I don't think range anxiety is as much of a problem as it used to no. be, um, but, but there is a cost delta. And, and yet, if those vehicles, which people purchase for one reason, mobility, but they're not driving all the time, and some people are, but most people, they park the car 90% of the time or more. If that yeah. vehicle could earn money while it's parked, now you can disrupt the total cost of ownership value proposition of an EV such that it's much more compelling than an internal combustion engine vehicle. And I think they will then fly off the shelf, so to speak. On the grid side, what's interesting is the single obstacle to scale deployment of renewables is really not the cost of generation. That's on parity with 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 others and, and more cost effective than, than, for example, nuclear power. But yeah. you need massive storage designed into the grid to be able to accommodate the intermittence and in generation from wind and solar relative to load from customers. And, for example, in the U.S., we've built out a pretty sizable stationary storage industry over the last couple of decades, heavily subsidized, supported by mandates in California. And that entire industry, as of just a few years ago, 2019, had about four gigawatt hours of aggregate dispatchable capacity. Whatever that number means, what's relevant is yeah. just the Nissan LEAF, since it became bidirectional in the U.S., there's more storage under the hoods of Nissan LEAFs at that point in time than the entire stationary storage industry. Right. And it's wow. not like yeah. the LEAF was you know, the dominant vehicle in America. It was a great early V E V and it still is a fantastic vehicle, but there aren't that many of them out there. And yet those vehicles still have more storage, relatively speaking, than than stationary storage. So the point is uh -huh. that's where the storage is going to come from. But it needs to be enabled. You can't just have the battery riding around on the wheels. It needs to be able to discharge into the direction of the grid to provide those value streams that are relevant. And so that's yeah. where V to X or vehicle to grid technology comes in, is it is the technology that enables the liberation of different value streams from a parked electric vehicle and presenting them to the different customers that might have an interest in those value streams and optimizes across that, that stack of revenue opportunities for the vehicle owner to give them the best economic outcome and the best, frankly, uh, planet impact uh, possible. So that's it was kind of a summary of where V to X sits, and I could describe a little bit more particularly, if you like, how it works. But but that's that's why I started the company, and that's what V to X is. Right. Because, I mean, I think one of the areas that people may not be, you know, the general public, are, and I certainly wasn't before I had an electric vehicle, the variation in cost of generating electricity, which has really been, uh, you know, exacerbated, if you like, by renewables. You know, so there are periods of time in the UK, for instance, where the wholesale price of electricity goes below zero because we have so much overcapacity and very low demand. Often this happens at night. And it's that, it's that aspect, I think, of renewables, of the renewables market that that a lot of people are not aware of. I mean, that, uh, and I just want to sort of, I would love you to explain 
how you can make money out of your car when it, if you if you do have uh, bi-directional charging enabled it through your house or whatever. It's a critical question, and these, to be fair, are early days in the emergence of this technology. So the, the market opportunities that will exist within a couple of years are not entirely present today. Uh, and if you go country to country, continent to continent, the pain points that the utilities have uh, that they experience is a little different from place to place. And the regulatory context in which this commerce can unfold also varies. But again, thinking in terms of large, you know, big muscle movements, let's take the U.S., uh, where EV to X has been very, uh, very effectively demonstrated. There's been some significant uh, success in the Netherlands and Denmark and, and absolutely in the UK, but the market environment's a little different there. In the US, most utilities, not all, they have a pain point, if you will, when it's the peak load, the, the meaning most customers have turned up the most electrical things. You know, it's late in the afternoon on a hot summer day and everybody has their heating and air conditioning cranked up to the, to the max. So the load on the system is at its highest. And a lot of utilities, particularly smaller utilities, they don't generate all of their electrons. They have to buy them from someone else in a wholesale market. So the, the cost of those electrons at those critical moments in the day are very, very significant. If, uh, if the customer, we have a, a, a vehicle that's a fleet vehicle that's deployed at a wastewater treatment plant in Rhode Island, because at that location, the utility has what they call a demand response program where they ask people to participate by offsetting yeah. their load peak. And that utility, National Grid, is able to pay the customers for participating in their program. So we had a Nissan LEAF with a 15 kilowatt uh, bidirectional DC charger installed at this wastewater treatment plant each of the last two summers. And each summer, the utility would send out a signal that we would respond to on behalf of that vehicle owner. Right. And the signal would be discharge the vehicle for three hours, for two hours, for right. whatever it is. And then we would respond to that signal. It's a very blunt instrument, very easy to do. That vehicle responded to 27 events, totaling 57 hours in its first summer. That's not a lot wow. of use of the vehicle. And all of yeah. those events were after 5 p.m., which meant they didn't in any way conflict with the mobility duty cycle requirements of the customer because it was a fleet vehicle, so it was parked. And that right. vehicle earned $4,200 for that effort. Wow. And this wow. summer, this summer, the price has gone up. The value of that function is higher. And with a 20 kilowatt charger this summer, we expect to earn $8,000 if we successfully wow. respond to the market. So that's an example of how the commerce plays out. And it, that is very significant amount of yeah. money. And there are utility demand response programs throughout the US. And there are some in, in Europe, but not quite as much. There are other functions that utilities have to perform for which this technology can provide value. In the European markets, there's a lot of issues with frequency regulation. That's the management of the, if you will, the oscillation of the sign curve, the sign curve of demand that sits at top of the demand curve. Like every, you know, every couple of seconds, if 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 generation of electrons isn't perfectly aligned with consumption of electrons, you get less than 50 hertz in the UK or 60 in the US. Yeah. But if you, so they have a market for that and they send out a signal to participants that says either in the case of a vehicle, charge or discharge for the next two seconds. And then we'll right. give you another signal two seconds later or 10 seconds or however the specific market is designed. That's the, another exercise you can do with a parked electric vehicle to address a different pain point and I could go on. The list is not insignificant. So there are existing yeah. mature markets today in Europe and in the U.S. and in Japan where a vehicle can participate and earn money today. And then there are all those other pain points that utilities experience for which there isn't yet a market mechanism developed because they didn't have this wonderful technology available to them. And we're working with utilities across the globe to figure out, is it a new tariff? Is it a new innovative business model? How do we solve that problem with these deployed vehicles effect cost effectively? And those just get added to the revenue stack over time. So the value right. of V to X will 
likely go up considerably over time. And I mean, the, what what's fascinating about this is, you know, the example you've given, which is really impressive, <laughs> you know, the fact that you could, that it's possible to generate that kind of income from just leaving your car plugged <laughs> in, you know, you're not using you're not using it you're not waiting for it it's when you're not using it it's doing it but the but the sort of impact the bigger impact which i think some people get that notion is 10 10,000 cars like that or a million cars that are connected in that way has a really big impact on the grid you know the grid of a nation like the uk or, or european countries or even the united you know areas of the united states could seriously benefit from having tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles connected in this way? Because then you're looking at, you know, enormous amounts of power available for a grid operator. The UK and the rest of Europe have been prudent by investing heavily in their uh, power generation infrastructure, generation and distribution. So you don't have the same uh, challenges. You have different challenges than, than yeah. we do. You know, you have... You, you have okay, all of a sudden the oil pipeline gets cut off and that's a big problem. Or you have a major nuclear event and a country decides to shut down their nuclear plant. So there are real, you know, movements that happen all over the globe and certainly in Europe. But another illustrative case is um, if, let's let's think of it this way. What's the scale of of the problem in the US? Um, If we deploy millions of electric vehicles. This is going to be a problem in Europe. It's going to be a problem everywhere. Yeah. It's a, a vehicle adds to the load. They're yeah. not always drawing electrons, but they do draw electrons. And when they do, they draw them heavily. If you yeah. if you look at Texas of, uh, two years ago in February, they had a major meltdown of the grid. That's because it got real cold and everybody turned up their heat. And a lot of people had electric heat. So the load on the system overwhelmed the generation capabilities right. of their system and the system went down, which meant people lost power and it was catastrophic. If you can imagine adding a million EVs to that ecosystem and yeah. they're single directional, they're unidirectional vehicles, they're just adding load to a load problem. They just make it worse and curtailing the load by smart management of the charging only reduces the amount by which they add to the load. It doesn't solve the problem, but yeah. If you had bidirectional chargers and bidirectional vehicles and you added a million of those to a situation like that, you can now send out a price signal to the vehicle owners. Hey, who wants to make a few bucks? Discharge because we are overloading our system over here in D- you know Dallas. Please discharge yeah. for the next 20 minutes and they can solve the problem instead of creating it. So it, it's right. important when we think about the transition to electromotive technology, the impact of that scale deployment of electric vehicles, if they're single directional, bi-directional, it's a hugely different scenario. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, cause the way I understand it, the because the, I, ha- I have a very old Nissan Leaf, which is which was which predates the bi-directional uh, development in Nissan Leaf. So it's a, it was made in 2010. So it's a very, it's one of the very early ones. But uh, I have had a, a more a, mo- a more recent Nissan Leaf hit at my house, and I have a, a bi-directional charger built into the house with Chadamo connectors. But of course, the two electric vehicles I have now don't have don't use Chadamo. They use CCS. So that is one of the kind of big questions I've been you know asking because you know in a in a sense certainly in europe ccs has won the war if there ever was one between chadamo and and ccs you know ccs is the dominant uh, uh, charging connector let, uh, but let me, it basically is, cha- let me challenge that a little bit yeah. if i can oh no do ahead, please now. yeah so I, I wouldn't say that's wrong and i wouldn't say it's right i would say it's too early to tell so right, okay. there were a lot of Chatamo vehicles and they were deployed. Certainly the Nissan Leaf, it's been bi-directional since 2013, but it's been Chatamo yeah. since day one. There are other vehicles, many of them, not just Nissan vehicles that are out yeah. there that are Chatamo, early deployed vehicles. And it's worth noting, I, I don't remember if this is true in, in the EU, but at least every Tesla in the US with a, an adapter from day one was able to charge at a Chatamo uh, charger. Not yes. so much with the CCS charger. 
but now they've right. been mandated by the Europeans and by the Americans to to accommodate a CCS, so that's being taken care of. But here's the thing. Chatamo does work out of the box because it's truly a standard. It's 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 a third party certification driven standard. So if the vehicle right. is Chatamo certified and the charger is Chatamo certified, they will work, period. And they're right. designed by a utility, TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, to be effective for the from the perspective of the utility. So the design of the Chatamo connector uh, uh, c- cable is specific accommodating of the vehicle's interest, but also the utility's interest. And that's something right. a lot of people don't understand. It, it was a resp- TEPCO worked with Nissan to, to create a bi-directional feature in Chatamo in response to the crisis they had with Fukushima. So yeah. that all said, the Chatamo standard was developed by the European OEMs and followed then by the American OEMs, largely because there were a lot of uh, CCS fast chargers out on the highway corridor. And they thought, well, we don't want to miss out on those. So we'll just go ahead and make our vehicle CCS. So yeah. the early days, it was tilted for Chatamo. Now it looks like it's tilted in the other direction. However, CCS is not actually a standard. To the extent it is a standard at all, it's self-certified. So what happens is each vehicle OEM implements it in a bespoke manner. And then you've right. got to make a charger that has to work with each of those different bespoke implementations. And that doesn't happen very easily. And then you add to mm-hmm. that, that the, the particulars, and I'll try not to be too in the weeds here, but some of the features of how uh, CCS works doesn't lend itself well specifically to bi-directional functions. Right. It does just fine for single directional, but when you end up having bi-directionality, there are some challenges, all of which I believe will be overcome, but it's yeah. going to take time. So in the near term, I, I expect to see a little bit of a swing back in favor of Chatamo because as more of those are out there making thousands of dollars, and yet the CCS vehicles are struggling to make as much money from VDAX, the market might have a different voice. I, right. I'm not making a prediction, and I'm not suggesting CCS won't sort itself out, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to delay things by several years at best. And right. so in the meantime, you know, this might shift back and forth. Then you have to take a final thought. The largest number of vehicles and chargers in the world are neither. They're yeah. uh, GBT in China. And right. GBT is kind of uh, like a specialized version of Chatham. It's very similarly configured. And so, you know, what's going to end up being dominant, particularly if the Chinese automakers can break into the European markets and also in the U.S.? I think it's an untold story, is, is my point. I wouldn't right. reach the conclusion that, you know, it's going to be CCS because it looks like it is. I don't know that it won't be. I just don't know that that's settled yet. But, right. Now, that's a very interesting take because I've just, I mean, without thought, I've j- just because it's so common here now and all the charges are CCS, you know, the rapid charges. But, uh, you know, th- th- I then think, oh, well, that's that's obviously one. You know, I mean, I didn't, I haven't got a, a vested interest in either in either type. You know. I actually I'm happy don't. To use it. Yeah. No, we we're agnostic as to vehicle. We're agnostic as to charger. We just want to yeah. take whatever we got and then go make yeah. money with it for our customers, and and that's what our business is. But but I will tell you, we've we've really been fortunate to be able to work with Nissan and with Chatamo. There's a a, a, a lot of vehicles out there already, and yeah. the Chatamo standard does work well because it was designed for this. So we've We've been able to accomplish something that that others on the planet have struggled to do, and that's to make thousands of dollars with vehicles across the yeah. U.S. And we now have some projects that are uh, that are underway in Europe, and they are so far all uh, Chatamo oriented. Right. But we do have a number of CCS projects also that we're working on, and so we intend to solve these problems. It's just going to take a little bit longer. Right. Because you know, one more thing on this topic, because I was fascinated. We went to Utrecht in the Netherlands, where there is a, a car sharing scheme run by a company called We Drive Solar. They use a lot of solar to charge their their car shares. And I'm I'm not one hundred percent certain, but I just looked it up before we we started talking to see, and I'm pretty certain they are using 
bi-directional type 2 chargers so up to 11 or up to 22 kilowatts so not ccs or chadamo type so type 2 like i use in my house to charge my cars here and they've uh, they have specially ad adapted renault zoe's and uh, hyundai ionic 5s those are the two cars that are capable of using this system I don't know if you have you heard about that, and is that a, a an area that you've done any research into? So much low, it's a much lower power level certainly than Chadamo. You're talking about onboard AC, which again, there's, yes, we, this is early days for the technology, right. but there are pros and cons of each. It's more cost effective to do onboard AC, absolutely, up to a point. But then as you get higher powers, now you're adding weight to the vehicle, you're adding cost to right. the vehicle, and there are some practical limitations on how much power you can extract uh, through an onboard AC. In the US, we have an additional layer of difficulty with the onboard AC, and that's to be allowed to discharge the vehicle anywhere in the US power grid. You have to get what's called an interconnection agreement. You need to get permission right. from the local utility to be allowed to discharge. Why is that? If Imagine if you're a utility and all of a sudden your customers all, of, all at once start sending power towards you at yeah. high levels, they're going to overwhelm transformers and all of the upstream infrastructure that you've deployed and that you're responsible for. And so they have to study the upstream infrastructure capacity for each site where that vehicle might be able to you know, discharge power right. and determine whether or not it's okay to give that permission slip. And I think you're going to find, so I think you're going to find onboard inverters uh, un, unlikely to scale. I think you're going to see as this technology plays out, you'll do your opportunistic charging at home overnight with an AC charger at a relatively right. low power level, you know, maybe six kilowatts or something like yeah. that. But if you want to do grid commerce, you're going to want to have a bidirectional charger and it's going to be off board the vehicle and it's going to be DC and you'll, it'll pay for itself. So you'll be happy to spend that extra money. But you brought you yeah. brought up something interesting when you mentioned the car share. I'd like to touch on if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so think of a traditional uh, the automotive industry historically, the vehicles were made with one function: mobility to move yeah. people or things from place to place. So the ownership models of vehicles have centered around that, which means that the person that needs the person or company that needs that mobility function, they own the vehicle. But now when you introduce an electric battery, massive storage, and some other sort of ancillary characteristics of electric vehicles, those vehicles now have value that can be presented to different customers other than the mobility duty cycle that went to the traditional vehicle owner. And, and if that becomes a reservoir of use, it might, we might see a very rapid transition in ownership models from I own my car because I want to drive it, but I park it 95% of the time yeah. to the vehicle as a service model, which is what this, you know, the car share uh, uh, case you were citing in, in, in yeah. Utrecht, that's going to grow, I think. And you'll see that what will happen is that asset will get rented out to different customers that are willing to pay the optimum value. So I, as a vehicle operator for mobility, I want my mobility to be the most important one. But if somebody says, well, if you don't drive it for the next hour, you can make this month's rent, uh, you yeah. might just rethink your, your travel needs. And sometimes yeah. you'll have no choice. So with V to X, the ownership models are going to evolve quickly. And we will also see with, with V to X that um, people relate to their ownership or their relationship with their vehicle will evolve. Right now, when we do V to X, we have, it, 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 let's compare that storage to stationary storage, all right? So yeah. stationary storage, which is, as I said, you know, a large industry, but, but trumped by the scalability of, of a mobile storage in vehicles when EVs really get to scale. But stationary storage has a significant cost associated with buying that storage because you have to buy the batteries for the storage because that's yeah. all that they do. If you now have a mobile asset, my batteries come free with the leather seats in the air conditioner, <laughs> but I do have two costs. They're non-monetary. One is I need to honor the mobility duty cycle that paid for the vehicle. So right now, 
that vehicle owner that owns that vehicle because they bought it for mobility purposes. They're not going to let me steal their battery for grid services when they want to drive to the grocery store. They just won't. So we're going to have to have a lot of coordination between the vehicle to grid uh, services operator. That's where my company stands and the vehicle owner. But that's manageable. That's very manageable. And over time, it actually gets easier to manage as you get to scale because I don't necessarily need to know which vehicle is going to be plugged in at a particular place. I just need to know how much dispatchable capacity I'll have in a particular utility district to bid into a market. The other cost that I have to pay attention to to get those free batteries with the leather seats and the air conditioning is the battery degradation impact of what we do. Yeah. Because if you think about it, the, the vehicle OEM, they selected electrochemistry and sized the battery based on mobility. And they knew that yeah. car was going to be parked most of the time. Now you introduce a use of that vehicle's battery that might really use the battery a lot. It might have a lot of cycles. It might have a lot of throughput. It might heat up the battery at times where that accelerates degradation. So the OEMs in the U.S. are on the hook for eight years and 100,000 miles of battery warranty. And there's been some threat of that even increasing. So that battery degradation variable is very important to successful V2X implementation. And you know, we as a company have focused a lot of energy on that. We actually have a patent that says it's issued in the U.S. and it's pending globally. It says if you do V to X and you take into account battery cell module pack or ambient air temperature, you step on our patent. The point is we really do understand battery degradation. And we've been able right. to persuade, for example, in September of last year, Nissan in North America announced that we are the only people that can discharge the Nissan Leaf in the North American markets and not void their warranty. Right. That was very significant. Wow. A lot of people went, oh, that's a thing? Huh, I didn't know that, but but it is a thing. So I just want to say that this 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 ecosystem of opportunity that's emerging in the form of V to X technology has a lot of nuances, technical and business-wise, that are going to yeah. have to be sorted out in the coming years as we scale the deployment of electric vehicles. Right. I mean, that is fasc it is a fascinating thing, because obviously those aspects are you know are often come up so when i if i've done a public talk and i've mentioned v2x and i explain what it the, the very basic idea then one of the very first questions is often well won't it just wear the battery out quicker to which i don't have a, an immediate answer but i mean effectively it is putting more wear and tear on the battery without but it, it, uh, is there an argument about the fact that it's not as intense as like if you put your foot down in a Nissan Leaf it's a very nippy little car you're putting more strain on the battery when you do that than you ever would connecting it to the house or the grid or whatever uh, Robert you're absolutely right so for example there's a study that was done a number of years ago and then updated at University of Warwick in the UK where they specifically looked at what are the battery degradation impacts on a Nissan Leaf from right. frequency regulation and uh, one other use case and they concluded that under the right circumstances, battery health was actually improved with V to X. Why is that? A typical customer will go home, plug their car in, charge it up to 100% state of charge, and leave it sit there plugged in all the time. That's not a healthy place for the battery to sit for extended periods right. of time. If the charge and discharge is controlled by a vehicle-to-grid services provider, they're going to park that vehicle closer to 70% state of charge or something like that when they're not using it so that they could have access to either up or down depending upon what the market application is. So that's thing one. Thing two is, to your point, some use cases like the discharge that I mentioned in Rhode Island at this uh, wastewater treatment plant, I, we made $4,200, you know, this summer we'll make 8,000 with literally 57 hours of nighttime utilization. That's not an enormous amount yeah. of you know, use compared to driving, you know, 12,000 miles or whatever the average kilometers are in, in, in Europe. And again, it's it was done under a managed and controlled uh, set of circumstances, conditions, which were designed to protect the battery from degradation. So I think the battery degradation fear, well, and, I'll, and one other data point, you know, a, a traditional vehicle, an internal combustion engine vehicle, if it gets 200,000 miles, that's a great vehicle. People got yeah. a lot of use out of it. Batteries degrade 
pretty minimally, they do degrade inevitably, even if they just sit, they have time as a degradation variable. Yeah. But the degradation impact of mobility and V to X when properly managed, those batteries are going to last a very long time. If, if you are obligated as a OEM to provide 70% state of charge or soon it'll be 80% state of charge, or you have to replace the battery with the warranty, it's many years till that battery declines to that point. And, and by the time it does decline to that point, the cost per unit of, of, of energy uh, for replacing that battery is, is continuously declining. So I, I don't yeah. think you're going to find the degradation is, the, the, is deserving the fear that it invokes right now. But it's really, it, it's a concern people have, but there is a warranty from the OEM, number one. And number two, batteries just don't really degrade that much from V yeah. to X. And if anything, it might add to battery health if done properly. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the thing that we've learned when I first talked to, it was, in fact, engineers from Mitsubishi and Nissan. So in about 2009, 2010, that period, the, the, they weren't being loud about it, but it was clear that they didn't really truly know how long the battery packs would last because no one had ever done that before. You know, it was very unknown technology. And they had a lot of, uh, you know, confidence that they would last a long time. That's all they would say. Whereas now we know, we know from experience, we've seen there's, you know, millions of electric cars have driven millions of miles and we know how long they last. So there's a slightly different, I mean, that's the argument I always try and explain to people that a lot of people's fears and anxieties about electric vehicles, I always think are about five to eight years out of date. You know, five years ago, you could say you could question a lot of these things, and now we know. Well, now we know they, you know, very the latest battery technology probably outlasts the car. The car itself will fall to bits long before the batteries degrade too much. A absolutely true. Um, we're actually working with a UK entity to develop battery um, insurance to to kind of solve right. the problem if the OEMs, for whatever reason, don't get there, but. But, but you raised a really interesting point um, when you asked the question about uh, the impact of fast charging. When you were yeah. talking to Nissan and Mitsubishi in 09, there weren't a bunch of very high-powered fast chargers out there that yeah. those vehicles could be charged on. Maybe 50 kW of power, but which is not it. small. Yeah. That, that, but yeah. that, but, but you, you see people putting out 300 kW chargers. Well, you know what? Yeah. If you look at a, at, at a vehicle, an electric vehicle, and you plug it in, to a 300 kW charger, it'll charge at 300 kW for a very short period of time, minutes yeah. or less. And then the, the battery management system says, wait, you're heating up my cells, wrap it, rat, ratchet it down. My point is, yeah. is that the, the fast charging technology is more of a perception than a real value because yeah. there are challenges in that rapid degradation of the battery that comes from really hitting it with a fast charge event. Plus, if you think about it, um, when when most people charge at home, I've been driving pure EV since yeah. before the Tesla Roadster even existed. I had a, right. an experimental vehicle from Ford back in 2007. I've never charged that vehicle anywhere but at home. I don't, right. it doesn't have great range, so I don't have to I don't go very far. But my point yeah. is 80% of charging events happen at home except for people who don't have the luxury of a charger at home. So they will tend yeah. to go to a fast charger. And so they tend to have degradation issues. I think you'll find workplace charging. I think you'll find, you know, a retail customer has the amenity of a charger available to them. I think you'll find public charging at lower rates become very ubiquitous very quickly over time. Yeah. And I think you'll find that the fast chargers are part of the story, but their main reason for existing is to accommodate long distance trips, which is a small right. percentage of trips, and yeah. to appease the perception that people have that, oh my gosh, I'll get stuck and I won't be able to fill up my tank in three minutes. But they can actually yeah. fill it yeah. up in you know 20 minutes while they, you know, they go get a sandwich. So I, I think you'll find that the yeah. fast charger that everyone thought was essential to uh, to EVs proliferating will not and it has a place it will always have an important place but it's not the dominant form of charging over time that we're going to experience yeah 
No, I absolutely agree. I mean, that's and, and that's from experience rather than from theory. You know, I, I know how I charge my cars. I because I thought I'd been driving electric cars for a long time, but I'm only 2009, so I'm a relative new <laughs> newcomer. But I'm very impressed that you've been using them regularly since 2007. That's amazing. You, you, there was a, you talk the, about the length, excuse me. You talk about the length of batteries. My first EV was a Ford Ranger EV that right. was one of the few that had a nickel metal hydride battery pack. My vehicle was put in service December of 1999, and that battery pack lasted till COVID, till 2000. That's a 20 wow. year life out of a battery. Yes. That, wow. That, that's and incredible. That was, and that's technology from the 90s, right? From the 90s, yeah. Yeah. But is, was that the same? Is that the same battery uh, chemistry that uh, uh, Toyota used in the Prius? Is that the, is it the same or similar battery system? I mean, it's similar. It's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same. I understood. Okay. As I understood, that specific uh, battery was a Panasonic battery, and that, from what I understood, they sold the patent for that uh, technology that they used in the Ford Ranger and in some of the uh, Toyota Rav fours. Panasonic sold it to Chevron, who blocked anyone from making that particular electric right. chemistry for about 15 years. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's a shame. <laughs> it's a shame because it was great energy density and it obviously lasted a long Lastly. time. But now we've, we've displaced that with, with other electrochemistries, lithium yeah. in particular, and others are coming. A lot of others are coming and they're yeah. going to all be yeah. as disruptive as each one of the ones before them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, I mean, there's one question I really wanted to ask you because I don't, because it's very much an American uh, uh, change. I, it was only from discussions that I had with people uh, from Ford with, uh, regarding the Ford F-150 when that first came out. So I, I've not driven one. I've sat in one at our show in America, but I've never driven one. But I do know that when the, they, they did a, a, a TV commercial, that I think was on at the, the last Super Bowl, which showed numerous things about the Ford F-150, how tough, how much it could tow, how it was good off-road and all those sort of things. But the thing that all the people from Ford that I spoke to said that they were surprised at was the reaction when they they, uh, they depicted a power cut in a city and then the guy who owns the Ford F-150 does something on his phone and his house is run off the car. Have you had any feedback from that? I mean, because I don't, also I have no idea what the technology uh, Ford are using for that or the connectivity or what they need to make that uh, happen. And I've heard one anecdote that someone ran their house for three or four days off their F-150 during a power out in, in, in the States, but that's all I know so far. Robert, that's a great question. Let me add a, a, a couple of thoughts in, in that direction. First of all, been announced that Ford's working with Fermata and, and someone else to develop V to X right. solutions with the F-150. That's as much as I can say about that. Right. Because we're okay. not disclosure. But they've said that publicly. So yes, we're familiar with You're what You're allowed Ford's to doing. say that. All right. What you'll notice, and, and by the way, I've driven the F-150. It is a spectacular right. machine. It's a little big for yeah. my taste, but, but it <laughs> is a really well-developed vehicle. Um, they're offering, well, let me back up. I mentioned that you could extract m multiple value streams from a parked electric vehicle beyond mobility, the traditional use yeah. of a vehicle. The single most valuable value stream, in my opinion, other than mobility, is backup power in the U.S. Again, you've right. invested in your grid infrastructure, so you don't have the power go out very often. It happens all the time in the U.S. It's, it's really a right. disaster. So, so backup power is a huge um, uh, value. For, for a customer in that vehicle. And, and so bi-directionality is what makes it possible to power the home. So the vehicle itself has to be bi-directionally enabled so that it can discharge. Now that doesn't immediately result in you being able to discharge beyond the home into right. the grid, because yeah. that's where you need to get an interconnection agreement. You have what's called a grid tied inverter on the vehicle. And the Ford products that have been announced publicly talk about doing backup power when the grid is down. They don't talk about discharging into the grid yeah. at other times when it's up. Inevitably, all of the OEMs will have bidirectional functionality on their vehicles. Most of them have announced intentions to do so in the last two years and are doing so in real time. And they will all end up being grid tied over time. But the early days... Right. Ford was very astute in recognizing that backup power feature had market appeal 
in the U.S. Yeah. But that same feature with the right kind of charger can actually make a whole lot of money while the power isn't down. And I think that's yeah. that's where vehicle to grid is going to be the disruptor that makes EVs really scale. And it's going to also, as I said, accelerate the deployment of renewables on the grid because it now presents all of that storage that's under the hood uh, to uh, to those folks. And, you know, I, I think vehicle to grid is really sitting at the center of this emergent new technology space. I think it's the critical link that's going to make it survive and, and thrive. Right. Because I mean, that, that, what, what, another aspect which I've uh, we we are, are actually going to make a show about, but we haven't done it yet, is when you have a large fleet of vehicles owned by a company. I mean, the the, the good example we have in the UK is one of the big Amazon distribution centres now only has electric vans coming out of it, Mercedes electric vans, which I do believe they are they are certainly investigating bi-directional charging if they're not already doing it but when you've got like literally hundreds of vehicles in one location and the kind of budgets that people like amazon would have to invest in that's obviously an expensive procedure i mean do do you have any involvement in fleet management effectively because that's a well it's a completely it's a totally different sector to an individual house that might have a vehicle to home system our first vehicles are all fleet vehicles. And the reason for that right. is because there weren't any, and still aren't in the U.S., any residential bi-directional vehicles that are grid tied. There aren't any. Right. There are a number of them promising to be unleashed on the market any day now. And those promises have been ongoing for several years uh, to, yeah. no, to no avail. We wanted, actually getting chargers is the biggest challenge. To do V to X, you need three things. You need a bi-directionally enabled vehicle. You need a bi-directional charger, which we think ultimately is an off-board DC charger. And then you need software platform heavily heavily based in artificial intelligence to be able to do accurate predictions and to optimize across the stack of revenue opportunities. So you need the software platform to manage the charging and the discharging of the vehicle in a way that protects the battery, protects the mobility duty cycle that paid for it, and maximizes the revenue opportunity from V to X. That's what my company is focused on. We're right. that we want to be kind of the Android, if you will, of, of V to X. So we want to be that operating system through which customers participate and then we present them into the into the different grid facing revenue opportunities. But some of those value streams, remember, are are of interest to different customers. And commercial customers in the US and not just in the US, there's equivalents in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. But there are commercial tariffs for the electric bill for comp for commercial sites that address the fact that a commercial customer might have a very high load requirement when they run a piece of equipment, for example. They might have to draw right. a lot of electricity for a period of time. And the utility then has to present, provide that level of load, even if they don't use it very much during the month. So the utility can't capture the cost of providing that upstream infrastructure right. to provide that maximum load that's needed or to satisfy that at maximum load that's needed based on the kilowatt hour business. So a lot of utilities have gotten permission to charge what's called a demand charge. That is, all right, you pay X, do- X cents per kilowatt hour. That's the volumetric measure of consumption of electrons. But then there's another charge for what's the fastest that the electrons were flowing through the pipe. That's the load. Right. The highest 15 minute or 30 minute uh, average load during the billing cycle, they'll say you pay us X dollars or, or, or pounds per kilowatt to match that load. So you can do behind the meter demand charge management with this technology. In that case, right. the person responsible for paying the electric bill is the beneficiary because you're reducing their electric bill. You, it's invisible yeah. to the utility because it's behind the meter. But that's actually a very lucrative value proposition also today in the European markets as well as the U.S. We have 5 million yeah. commercial customers with demand charges above $15 a kilowatt. With that kind of right. demand charge, you can be pretty much paying off your leaf every month if you accurately yeah. predict when the building load is going to happen and the vehicle's parked and available to discharge and you successfully do it. So a well-coordinated yeah. vehicle-to-grid uh, uh, program with a fleet customer 
can save them enormous amounts of money. And so, yeah. yes, we have focused heavily on fleet deployments throughout our history while we wait for the residential bidirectional chargers to come out and to be effective. And then we will add that into our network and and grow that part of the business. So, yes, it's right. very much a fleet centric uh, uh, business right now. And, as right. It, and it will always have an important role in fleets. There's a lot of pressure, ESG and climate commitments that major corporations have made that motivate them to accelerate their deployment of electric vehicles. But, you know, you take a, a company like Amazon, and I have to be careful how I word this because I wouldn't want to <laughs> share anything I'm not allowed to share, but any major yeah. company like that is going to have the problem of, all right, I want all these electric vehicles. I want to deploy them at my site. Well, what if the upstream infrastructure can't handle it? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely makes sense. And I mean, I kind of, in a way, want to sort of uh, come to a final point in the fact that you and I are going to be of a vaguely similar uh, vintage. <laughs> I'll say it as politely as I'm, possible. But I think what I'm I find the really... Animal animal animal. Animal. <laughs> <laughs> but what I find really uh, interesting is the fact that the discussions that we're having now... And the, challenge, the genuine big challenges we've got and the, and the complexities of what we're doing and what you're talking about and how the grid is adapting to this sort of thing and how the vehicles are adapting. What I find exciting is when I was a 20-year-old, this, this was not even on the horizon as far as I could see. You know, if I'm talking 40 years ago, 50 years ago. You know, it was just like... You got you got a car and you bought petrol from it or gasoline, you know, and you filled it up and you drove it and then you parked it and you left it. There was no discussion around that. There was no other use for it. I didn't ever think about it. You know, all I, it was only once I got an electric vehicle that I started to think about, you know, initially, well, where does the electricity come from? And then I went, well, well where does the gasoline come from or the petrol? I'd never thought about it before. I complained about how much it cost, but I didn't consider that. And we're now entering this world, which I've, I'm personally very excited about, that the opportunities and challenges are enormous. You know, it's not all, I always say, electric cars won't save the world, but they kind of open a door that allow us to see a different way of using energy and using materials. And I think I feel I'm getting that feeling from you that it's, it's a, very, a very exciting, the prospects are exciting and, and as exciting as they are challenging, if you like. I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm 67, so I'm usually am the oldest guy on the call. But and when I was uh, growing up, with the same up, age, with the same age, well, <laughs> actually. So, so, so I, I, I'm right there with you. So when I was growing up, your vehicle that you selected was part of your personal brand identity in the community yeah. of people that you hung with. My kids, it's just a nuisance. Oh, I got to pay insurance. Yeah. Oh, I've got to find a place to park it. They really are eager to see this as a service model, the car share yeah. model erupt quickly. So they don't have to be bothered. They just want to have access to a vehicle. They don't care which one it is necessarily. No. And I think the younger generations are even more concerned about climate impacts. So they are paying closer attention to where's my yeah. fuel coming from? And is, there, is it better that it's electric? And so I do think you're right that condition, societal conditions are pushing us dynamically towards an electromotive world. And they're also pushing us towards a renewable energy world from a generation standpoint on the grid. Yeah. And that's where this technology of vehicle to grid is fascinating because it really enables each of those to happen at scale. And and so yeah. that's that's why I started the company and that's why I'm excited about it. Right. Um, and I'm grateful that you've taken some time today to share with your uh, your audience it, some of the details on this exciting technology, because I think one of the biggest challenges to the successful scale deployment of V to X technology is people don't understand it. Regulators yeah. make bad choices. They select technologies. They should remain technology neutral. Let the market yes. sort that out. You know, don't make us put CCS if in fact it delays the onset of electrification by five years because we have to work out problems that we don't with some other standard like Chatham. I mean, yeah. I'm not, again, advertising for Chatham here. I'm just saying there are real world challenges that this technology is facing and regulators add to them when they make choices. They give huge yeah. subsidies for stationary storage in California, huge subsidies. Right. Mobile storage doesn't count. But yet for the ratepayers of those utilities that are paying those subsidies, 
if they're subsidizing a power wall, a Nissan Leaf is four and a half power walls under the hood. A yeah. Ford F-150 is close to 11 power walls under the hood <laughs> in terms of the size of the battery. Yeah. And they, again, come free with the leather seats and the air conditioning. So as yeah. mobile storage becomes better understood, I think we'll see some of the, the some of the regulatory bias in favor of other earlier arriving technologies like stationary storage and 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 so forth will dissipate and then i think right. it'll really get going and, and and i think that those i think we're right now we're deploying we have deployed leafs and bi-directional chargers that we made ourselves we're not in the charger business but i couldn't get anybody to make chargers so we bought a right. company and made our own and now everybody's making bi-directional chargers Nissan got bi-directionality a decade before anyone else did, but now everybody yeah. else is following their lead and going bi-directional. So the, the ecosystem of opportunity is expanding rapidly. And, you know, right. I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that very quickly we will see dramatic changes in accelerating electromobility, accelerating renewables on the grid and people enjoying the technology as well. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, David. No, it's been really I mean, it's been really for me. I've learned a lot talking to you, and it's and it's it's ended on a very high note, which is the best you can possibly ask for. Which is fantastic. No, thank you so much for your time today, and I mean, really good luck. And I will put links to your to your page and everything in the show notes for this episode, so people can can uh, find out more from that. But it sounds like you're pretty busy, and you're you're doing pretty well. The company's. No, I see. you're doing okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm driven by the, the the strategic objectives of the company, not the economics. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an old guy. I've been an entrepreneur a number of times. I'm, I'm, I'm at this point entirely focused on the mission of making vehicle to grid happen because it liberates the electrification of yeah. the global vehicle fleet and it accelerates the transition renewables, which to me are, are deeply felt personal uh, objectives. And and yeah. and you're right. It is it is a high note because I think this technology is suddenly everywhere. We've been to conferences yeah. where two years ago nobody had heard of VDX, or that's all they'd heard of is they've heard of it, and now they're yeah. talking about it. And there's people making presentations about it. And so I'm I'm excited yeah. to see how quickly this this will erupt on the scene at scale. And 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 Brilliant. frankly, it's folks like you, Robert, that that make that possible because you're broadening exposure to this very interesting but complicated technology to a wider yeah. audience. And and I'm grateful for your efforts to do that. And if you're ever interested in doing a, an additional show, talking on any of the features of the technology, I'm happy to support that effort. That is fantastic. No, thank you, David. I'm, we, we will, without question, be in touch. No, that is a really good, that's a really good idea because I, I absolutely agree. It's critically important and it, it really defines what this new technology that we're talking about and using is is you know it's it's one of the amazing extra advantages of it that uh, i think a lot of people still don't fully uh, comprehend and you're absolutely right but you've really helped explain it today so that's great great stuff thank you so much thank you for having me you take care of well i really hope you enjoyed that i certainly had a, a really it was just a fascinating time. When time flies, when you're doing a podcast, you know it's kind of interesting. You know, I didn't even notice the time. I have a ticker at the top of my screen that is telling me what t how long we've been recording. And I looked at that when it was f 54 minutes and 40 seconds, you know, just before we finished. So that was a really good, uh, really good indication. Um, that's all. Uh, you know, do check out the fully charged dot show webpage if you're interested in the live shows. That's enough from me. Uh, please do join us again on the Fully Charged Show podcast. Please do tell your mates about it. Please do uh, subscribe. Uh, I ask your mates to subscribe. And uh, as always, if you have been, thank you for listening.